All right, good afternoon. Now I'd like to bring the regular afternoon meeting of Township of Langley Council to order. And the first item is to, uh, let me get some agendas, to approve or adopt and, re and receive the agenda items. Could I have a motion, please? Councilor Arneson, second. Councilor Qualley, all those in favor? Opposed and carried. Next one is adopt the minutes of um, regular afternoon council meetings September 17th and September 24th. Councilor Fox moves. Seconder. Second. Councilor Qualley. Any errors or omissions? See none. All those in favor? Opposed. Carried. And now a motion to resolve into special closed meeting. Move. Councilor Fox. Second by Councilor Whitmarsh. I'm going to add a legal. One legal. And with that, all those in favor? Opposed. Carried. Thank you. And now we resolve into special closed. All right, good afternoon. I'd like to reconvene the regular afternoon meeting of Township of Langley Council. And uh, the next item on the agenda are pres is presentations. And D1 is a Township of Langley Food System Study. And uh, we have a uh, presentation from the Institute of Sustainable Food Systems, Quantum Polytechnic University. And if you please come forward and welcome here. I'll ask you to introdu introduce yourselves. And uh, looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. Oh, I'll turn on your mic. Just so there you go. It's on. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, my name is Kent Mullenix. I'm the director of the Institute for Sustainable Food Systems at Kwantlen Polytechnic University. With me today is research associate uh, Emily Hansen, excuse me, and senior research associate uh, Dr. Uh, Wallapak Paula Sub. It's our pleasure to be here today and provide a briefing on the study that we conducted for the township of Langley. The uh, Institute for Sustainable Food Systems uh, uh, relishes its opportunity to work for and support our communities, and we appreciate the opportunity to support the Township of Langley. Today, we will re be providing brief information on the project's background. We will describe the study's components and the outcomes of the study, and uh, uh, Ms. Hansen and Dr. Polisub will be uh, sharing that information with you. As you may recall, this study for the Township of Langley emanated from the Southwest B B uh, British Columbia Bioregional Food System study that we conducted in the Township supported uh, operationally and financially. And subsequently, the township came to us and asked if we could conduct a similar study evaluation for the township specifically. And we were pleased to do that. It gave us an opportunity to apply the model and methodology to a smaller uh, jurisdiction. And we learned uh, a, a great deal uh, in doing so. We, uh, the, the uh, objectives of the uh, study are to uh, provide local and regional information, uh, data-driven information about the potential to bring forth uh, local food systems that contribute to the local economy and make recommendations for the township on what kinds of agriculture uh, would be suited here and how it could contribute to a, a, a local regional food system and then provide some information about how uh, agriculture in a regional food system in the township of Langley can, could contribute to a larger regional food system. The township of Langley, as you know, is, uh, uh, has a, a land base that is substantially agricultural land reserve land. About 75% of the land base, uh, half of that land or a little bit less is currently farmed and a significant amount of acreage in the township of Langley is classified as underutilized agriculture land. And that underutilized agriculture land presents uh, uh, opportunity for the township of Langley. And that is what we focused our study on. 
The uh, components of this study uh, will include uh, our self-reliance modeling, our post-production case study, and a farm-to-table case study. The two latter components were an add-on to the uh, study that, that uh, you asked us to do. Thank you, Kent, and good afternoon, and thank you, everyone, for welcoming us here. So we going, I'm going to present all the results briefly, and if you have any questions, we can talk about it later. In the first study, we have the food self-reliance, and this is the application of the Southwest BC food system modeling, and the idea is we wanted to explore the potential of using underutilized land in the township, what would benefits would bring if we have all this land into food production. The idea of food self-reliance is it's a scale from zero to 100. Zero means that um, you don't produce any food, and 100% means that all the food you eat comes from the township of Langley. And currently, we estimate that uh, the township is 38% food self-reliance, and I have to say that the 38% is on uh, an optimistic scale because of the various assumptions we have to make regarding um, what produce here, consume here. So th the, the real value could be uh, lower. And in the future, we model the future scenarios in 2041, and that's the um, long-range planning timeline for Metro Vancouver and the township as well. And so in the future, when the population increase, and if nothing changes in terms of the diet and the, the amount of land in production, the type of food that we produce and eat, then our food self-reliance will decrease to 27%. And the other future scenarios, we model different scenarios, but we picked two more to provide examples of how the township can increase its food self-reliance. In the next scenario, we model uh, a scenario where we put all the underutilized land, which is about um, 9,000 hectares or about 25,000 acres, if we put all of these into food production, food production, so it's had to be food. And we're focusing this food production to both export market and the local market. When I say export market, it doesn't mean export to the other countries. It could mean also export to other regions in BC, in Canada, or other countries. If that is the case, our food self-reliance will increase to 68%. That comes from double the amount of land that we have into production. And in the next scenario is if we focus everything into the local market, so just everything into the local production in the local market and no export, then the food self-reliance will increase to 74%, and that represents the maximum theoretical maximum level of food self-reliance that the township can achieve. So what we've learned, the key findings that we've found is that uh, the township of Langley has an advantage in terms of has a lot of land, and this land, if we put into food production, we could increase the food self-reliance, not only the food self-reliance of the township, but also food self-reliance of the uh, Metro Vancouver in general as well. So the township of Langley can be a big player in, in, contribution, in, in, in contributing food self-reliance of the region. And also, uh, if that is the case, we also have to remember that um, if we increase local food production, there would be some environmental impacts. Therefore, we will have to have um, mitigation regimes or adaptation regimes in place to, to deal with this uh, increase in food production. And the next study, we look into the post-production sector. We talk to wholesalers, uh, storage facilities, and distributors, processors, and also farmers, and to, to try to explore what's going on in the post-production sector. And we found that we do have post-production capacity in the township. However, this post-production capacity are uh, designed to serve large-scale producers. And then you might ask, well, what's the problem here? The problem may be that uh, most of our food system actors in, in the township are actually uh, smaller scales. And so therefore, and, and these people are the ones that are going to contribute to the vibrant local food system. So therefore, we have to find a way to see um, what barriers they have and how we can help them. And 
we found that um, there are several barriers, uh, for example, um, Canada GAP certificate or uh, access to slaughter facilities or even um, a few bylaws, for example, the one that said uh, limited uh, second dwellings, especially for those who have to lease land or, or those who need to have um, housing for, for um, laborers, for example. And additionally, we found that the, the key point here is that for, for smaller scale producer, they, they, it's really hard for them to access um, the, the supply chain, the traditional supply chain. So therefore, maybe there has to be an alternative um, way of the distribution of supply chain for small scale producers. And next is the farm to table or farm to restaurant case study. We wanted to investigate this marketing channel because we want to in investigate the demand for the local food through restaurants and also we think that this marketing channel could be something that could increase the consumption of local food. So we interviewed uh, 55 restaurants and also 20 farmers and tried to identify what type of food, what type of products that restaurants um, buy in highest quantity and also how could we uh, identify also best practices of how to make this marketing channel viable. So we found that for the best practices, how to make this better in terms of have, um, to have it to be a, 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 a viable marketing channel. So we have to have a platform between farmers and chef to communicate because communication and relationship building is the key here right now. Uh, chefs don't know where the farmers are, what they produce, and farmers don't know well which restaurants want to buy local, local food and how much they want to buy. So there, there needs to be a platform for these people to, to communicate and make connections. And also, as we know that um, locally sourced food is limited to season, and so therefore it's one of the barriers. And other barriers that restaurants often cited are um, convenience, because they want to be able to deal with one-stop shopping instead of contacting different restaurants. And another one, uh, another important barrier is the price. And finally, there are local champions, I call them local champions, so restaurants who, who commit to buying local food and also right now already buying from local farmers. They're local farmers, uh, they're local champions in the township and, and they are driven by values. So they have their value and they wanted to support the, the food system. However, um, many of the restaurants that we talk to, many of them still think that consumers are not really quite grasp or, or are not really interested because they don't hear consumers said, hey, we want you to buy local food. They don't feel the pressure from the consumer. So this represents a little bit of a disconnection between what consumers say about supporting local food and their action. And next, Emily is going to uh, wrap up the studies and also present some recommendations. Okay, thanks, Wallapak. Um, so for this last section of the presentation, I'm going to go over the cumulative findings of these three studies that we did. And this will briefly touch on the question of what to grow in the township of Langley, as well as some recommendations about development of a local food system. So uh, the objectives of these studies, as covered by my colleagues, were to provide township specific information about the food system and to provide some guidance about what to grow in the township based on the analysis of food self-reliance and also to provide insight into the role of the township in the broader bioregional food system. So the question of what to grow in the township was posed as part of this study. The suggestions that we're offering are primarily explore the possibilities of bringing this underutilized farmland into production that we've spoken of and increasing local food self-reliance. In other words, we're suggesting what can be grown in the township to feed the township and its neighbors. So based purely on an assessment of agricultural capability, there are a few limitations to food production in the township based on the capability of the soils here um, and the climate um, in the region. So some suggestions of crops 
and sectors to, to support include um, in the vegetable sector, for example, root vegetables, which can be grown through the summer and fall seasons and can be stored throughout the winter. And this is one example of something that we found in our farm to table case study was in demand um, by local restaurants and was being grown by local farmers. And different products for ethnic markets, such as Asian greens, are in demand across the region. And this is an example of something that can be grown as part of a diverse, small-scale vegetable operation in the township. Another example um, would be high-value crops, such as garlic and fruit. And these could be grown um, viably at a small scale in the township. Poultry for meat and egg production um, can be produced viably on small farms for the local and for regional markets. And other forms of small-scale livestock production with a focus on product differentiation and value adding. So this could include raising heritage breeds of livestock, uh, grass-fed livestock, specialty butchering, and cheese making. So through this study, we demonstrated that the township could significantly increase, increase food production by bringing underutilized farmland into production. And we've highlighted here some of the sectors which could have potential for growth as part of this local regional food system. Um, but these new and expanded forms of production would require support from an appropriate and accessible post-production sector, as well as local food distribution channels. Uh, so next I'm going to briefly review the food system recommendations that were result, uh, that resulted from the findings of these studies. And we've grouped the recommendations um, to sort of cover four different food system areas. And these are crop uh, and livestock food production, post-production and processing, retail and distribution, and waste management and envir environmental impact mitigation. And because we have some time constraints on our presentation today, um, I'm just going to highlight some key priorities in each one of these sectors. And these priorities correspond to recommendations, actions, and policy and programming examples that we've detailed um, in the summary report for this project. So the first, sec so the first area, food system area, um, is primary crop and livestock food production. So here, the priorities are creating opportunities for farmer education and training in production sectors that have growth potential for the township as well as the development of viable farm businesses, which can be supported through business development support um, and education. And finally, helping farmers to access land for food production with a focus on small scale producers and new farmers. The next area is post-production and processing. And here, some of the priorities include developing scale-appropriate facilities that serve local producers who are selling to the local market, and the continued development of supportive policy for on-farm value-added processing in the township, and developing cooperatively owned or shared facilities that support small business growth and innovation. The next area is distribution and retail. And the priorities here are to build capacity for local food aggregation and bring more local food to the local market, uh, to increase the diversity of retail opportunities that are available to local food producers in the township, and provide accessible and up-to-date information to the public and consumers in the township about when and where they can find local food. Uh, and finally, the last area is waste management and environmental impact mitigation. And here the priorities are um, to continue to support the management of manure, of livestock manure on farms, and to promote increased efficiency in food production, which includes a reduction um, in the greenhouse gas emissions that are associated with producing food. And finally, building the soil carbon capture capacity on farm through innovative innovative farming practices. Uh, so that completes the presentation part of um, our time with you today. So if you have any questions for Kent uh, Wallapak and I, we can answer them now. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Qualley. 
Thanks. Thanks for following up on this. This is uh, super interesting information. Can you go back? I think it was perhaps Dr. Mulinex's beginning slides that talk about the um, uh, farming of food and the percentages. Uh, it was at the very beginning of the presentation, I think. Math? Yeah. Yeah, so 45% of the ALR is currently farmed. So just because it's currently farmed, this isn't that number doesn't mean food production. That's just farming in general. Yeah. So that could mean trees and wine and flowers or whatever. Yeah, so actually it's about two-thirds of the currently farm area is in pasture and forage. So very little now in, on food, in food production. Okay. Um, okay, so, well, pasture is not considered food production because that's where the animals graze that yeah, potentially yeah. turn into food. Is that not considered? It, it would depend on what the pasture is supporting. It's equine or if it's um, yeah. right. sheep. If, if it's horses, no. Correct. Okay, but you don't know what that. Yeah, we don't. We don't know. Beef cattle, yes. Right. Okay, so it could be uh, poultry and um, pigs could and be. whatever. Okay, so um, you know, I I looked at a lot of the pieces in here, and there's a lot of really great work being done right now locally to sort of support some of your findings. Um, on November 13th, BBC is hosting an event in Vancouver. Um, you're nodding. Do you know about this event? It's uh, called Every Chef yeah. Needs a Farmer, Every Farmer Needs a Chef. And it's an event that's meant to bring the two stakeholders together and, and do some crop planning and create some relationships and stuff. So things like that are really valuable for the introduction of farmers to restaurateurs. One of the things that I've been hearing for my whole life in food production and food processing is that the chefs that can buy local food have to go visit every single farm every, you know, twice a week or three times a week to get the fresh product. And it just becomes really cumbersome for them because they're generally a small business that's out <coughs> literally running errands all day to go back to the restaurant to prepare the food. So I'm not sure if you know about um, in Abbotsford, they've recently started a Valley Food and Farm Collective. And so that's the place that everybody's coming together to sort of bring the chefs and the farmers into one place so they can do their shopping. And I'm excited to see some of the Langley farmers participating in this. And I think this is going to start to have an impact on some of the things that you're talking about in here about bringing, um, you know, the, the chef to the food and, and vice versa. So I'm excited to see that stuff's already happening uh, in regards to a lot of these priorities here. And, you know, I have to recognize our sustainable ag, um, associate, or our sustainable agricultural group that's been working here in the township of Langley because they've been pretty uh, proactive in their discussions about food hubs and all kinds of things. And it just, you know, in a township as big as we think we are, we're still pretty small, right? And so the opportunity, I think, to collaborate with Abbotsford and even Surrey uh, Chilliwack on this um, Valley Collective, I think is ultimately going to be super meaningful for some of the farmers here. Um, sorry, I'm just, this is so interesting to me, so I'm really excited to see your information, but I did have one specific question for you, and it's around the threat to our food security from cannabis. Have you guys brought any of those um, ideas or the displacement of food to cannabis into any of your research yet? No, counselor, we have not. No, we, seem we, many we have purposefully have. kind of walked away from that question. The we, increase in consumption of cannabis may increase the desire for more food, like, uh, like yes. Doritos. And, I'm thinking but, not fresh vegetables oh, okay. and protein, Mary Rose, but I could but, be mistaken. People could crave carrots, yeah. I suppose. To, to your point, though, cannabis is not food. It is not and food. And it will not advance regional food security. And it, and it will not contribute to a regional food system. Yeah, and we've already seen a displacement of food here in the municipality for the use of, for the production of cannabis, so. I, I think it's fair to say that that movement represents another um, economic displacement of farming and food production, without a doubt. 
Well, thanks for your report. I'm anxious to see as this kind of evolves over the next few years, but I appreciate your good work on this. Thank you. Thank you. And Councillor Arneson. Yes, thank you very much for coming. Um, I had a question, actually, and I, I wrote it down, but then I think you uh, responded to it, but I'd like a little bit of clarification. Um, so you're indicating that there seems to be a gap or a deficiency in uh, post-production. So for our local producers, they're not able necessarily to find some place within our community that's probably scaled to what they're um, producing. So... Um, does your research talk generally about co-ops because you were talking about the way to uh, collectivize that need? Because I have done some research and I, I know that other uh, countries actually have things along those lines and co-ops are becoming, um, it's not that they ever went away, but they're becoming a bigger thing now with the shared economy and economies of scale. So do you have any specific uh, information about that in particular? There is no specific information in the report, and the study did not uh, seek to provide any specific information on how the post-production sector could or should be developed, okay. simply to identify that it needs to be supported and developed. We are doing work um, separately to uh, delineate what a post-production sector in a local regional food system could and should look like and operate and we'll be making that information available soon it is it is the linchpin in bringing forth a robust local regional food system and we recognize that uh, I've become aware of people who are local producers and the challenge because of the larger scale operations to have their animals processed. And I know that um, micro uh, processing is something that other communities are going towards. Um, thank you very much for that. I did have another question uh, for the waste management. So you're talking about strategies in order to uh, mitigate or reduce the negative effect of uh, manure on the environment. Um, what about biofuel generation? Is that something that was considered in any way? Well, uh, again, Councillor, we, we simply recognize the need to deal with that component of the food system. And uh, we, didn't, we did not in this study, because it focused on the potential for food self-reliance and the utilization of land for food production, we, we did not focus on uh, strategies to directly uh, deal with these these components of the food system beyond productions we simply to recognize that they are pieces of the system that need to be addressed yeah thank you i understand it's like a road map and you're projecting if we don't do something that this will be what we end up at I exactly we we, we will uh, uh, ultimately take it upon ourselves to to work to deal with these different different pieces but we're just not there yet yeah. thank you yeah. Councilor Davis uh, thank you well just well I'm uh, could you put the last slide on so I could take a picture of the uh, of your web emails or your contact information I just um, on, on just hang, just for a second on that could, do, can we have access to this presentation if you could provide it to us so that may help you we'll, we'll if you can provide us to the presentation we can distribute it to you, but yeah, that's that all. Works I, for you? Okay. Yeah, that's all. I, that's kind of that, that would be great. Um, and, and I've been with the ACC and the EED uh, when you gave the presentation. And I, um, again, I just, I probably you, um, I commented on regulations for food production, and I mean, even last night we learned about the the new name for the uh, US MC trade deals now, and. And that's like a moving target because you kind of have to. Um, I guess you don't because we're we're in the township and it's focused on the township. But there are things like that that can affect it um, and make it harder to to come to some sort of a conclusion um, because you're 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 forecasting. And me other regulations is like the quality of food that can hugely impact. Um, food, you know, if you took the right, um, you know, I can buy a load of potatoes, a 20 ton of potatoes for 300 bucks and I could eat every one of them, but a wheelbarrow full, you know, that because, you know, that's, so that's huge. Um, so it's, 
um, the, I guess the hungrier we would get, the less regulations you have. <laughs> Uh, and I'm not being cheeky. It's just that, you know, if we get hungry, you're going to eat that apple with a little scar on it. Or, you're, yeah, you're going to make applesauce out of the apples that have gone too far. But anyhow, and the, and the value of land is huge because now you've got to, you've got to talk people into participating um, and producing on a five-acre piece of property and uh, that sort of stuff. So, But I think it's the study uh, like this is... <laughs> Of all the things we need to study, we need water, we need food, and we need clean air and that sort of thing. So, uh, anyhow, just maybe comments. I didn't really have a question, so I, I would love to read the report in full. So, uh, Councillor, the, the point you make is a good one. The, the uh, advancement of a robust, meaningful local regional food system won't occur in isolation of uh, the policy environment and economic strategies and municipal and provincial government support and, and all those things and we're not so naive as to think that you can just it's just going to happen uh, I think the, the point is and what we hope that the report will uh, s support the township of Langley doing is thinking about what it can do to uh, incrementally advance a robust uh, meaningful uh, local regional food system that that enhances the community economically and socially take away the opportunity yes exactly you yeah, know thanks it's oh. interesting that councillor davis mentioned potatoes because kennebec potatoes are grown uh, quite extensively in uh, in delta and richmond and they supply almost all the restaurants around here but um there was a couple of things that interested me in your slides one was uh, you talked about the communication factor between restaurants and farms so and then you just said now that that the report's going to be handed to us for us to do something. But is there any move anywhere to sort of create that vehicle for communication between restaurants and uh, farmers? I know, I know that um, in, in the township, we are going to have um, the first kind of meeting later in, in November after the Every Chef Needs a Farmer event. So I think Eva Reeves is going to work with the young agrarian with us as well. And we wanted to... Um, start a network for farmers in the township. And so we also would like to invite some restaurant to come and, and make connections. So I think it's a first step. I might suggest that you get a hold of the BC Restaurant Association. There, there's actually quite an activity locally with, uh, with them, and they could be a vehicle by which you could uh, help with that. Yeah. The other thing that you mentioned in one of the slides, uh, the types of crops you thought would be recommended. I saw a picture of a carrot and so forth in there. So is um is that information that can easily i mean here we have the presentation but i wonder if that information couldn't be made more public so that farmers understand that hey there's a there's a particular market in some of these um some of these uh, vegetables we, we plan to make our report available online on our website as well okay so it will be accessible by everyone well can you make sure you, you send uh, yeah. us the link then so that yeah. we can help to uh, to put the word out thanks for your work it's very interesting okay. thank you I don't see any other questions. Thank you very much for your presentation. Agriculture is near and dear to my heart. I uh, grew up on a farm, have a farm, and some of the points you make, I heard my dad say many, many years ago that when we say consumer support and actions, he always said the consumers vote with their pocketbook. So you can ask them what they want to buy when they go in the store, and they're all saying they're going to buy organic and local, and they come out with whatever's the cheapest. So mm -hmm. huge shift there. Uh, but a big part of that, I think, is the uh, distribution chain and, and how... Um, the larger grocery stores will look for the cheapest product and they don't care where it comes from. It'll come from California, Mexico, and other parts where our local producers don't have a market. So um, that's, that's a big, big problem. Uh, and so you have the four different avenues where you're focusing on. I think there should be a fifth. And, that, and Councillor Davis raised it and how the... Uh, the latest negotiations we just I just heard today that the dairy industry has now lost three and a half percent to American production, which is another uh, erosion to Canadian uh, farmers and to Canadian food for and there's absolutely no reason that we need to take American uh, dairy products. We have enough dairy products here, but um, politically, I think our dairy farmers have been sold down the river again, and uh, it, it'll ricochet through all kinds of other quantities. So having advocacy of uh, policy, whether it's at the local level, the provincial level, or federal level, is extremely important. 
Uh, I'm very careful when I go in a grocery store. If I see a, a pears or peaches or whatever that come from China, I don't buy it. I'm sorry, I, I just will refuse to buy it. I'll, I won't eat them if, if there's nothing else there. And, but not every consumer is like that. So it's the policies that are in place, and it's the way the large grocery store chains, where most of the food is. I mean, it's great to have small production, an acre or two, but that's not the really big food production. It's our policies that are right through uh, our, our government and uh, uh, where we allow the imports of products into our country during the same season we have the products here. So I think advocacy is, is a big one. Uh, so I really appreciate what you, what you have to say here. I, as I know, I've, I've farmed all my life, and uh, it's... I've got a small farm where we've partnered with other farmers and we've marketed our product throughout British Columbia, uh, but it's taken a long time to get to that, but it's partnerships and it's working together, but not everybody can do that, and we, just, we have a small niche of the whole, whole market. The, the main commodity is under attack, and uh, whether it's uh, poultry, whether it's um, our commodities, or you know, like uh, vegetables and fruits, I mean, try and find an apple in, in the Okanagan now, and we have to get apples from the state. So advocacy, uh, I think, is a big part of it, uh, that you have to advocate for policy. Uh, that that'll support our local farmers because it gets awful boring awful fast when you're going broke farming you know it can be really exciting when you start but you get bored pretty fast when you're going broke so just my comments thank you Councilor quality wants to finish it up sorry Oops, i just i didn't mean to take away from yeah. your comments they're really valuable and i think um you know engagement with our community around food um and you guys are doing a really good job i think the engagement with um, the people who want to grow their own gardens and plant their own lettuce and tomatoes and things um, and, and allowing them into your seed library to take advantage of the things that, um, that they can grow here successfully really is an opportunity to engage people about um, their own food security and where food comes from. And to Mayor Froze's point about knowing what you're buying and buying seasonally and, and how, you, how your shopping habits are formed, I, th I think... Um, Quantlin does a really good job of supporting our community in the, their ability to kind of get their hands into the soil and, and grow some of their own food. And that ultimately drives this whole discussion because they'll have those conversations about where the rest of the food's coming from that's not coming out of their backyard. So thank you for that as well. Great. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so we'll move on to reports to Council. F1 is... Uh, a, it's the Investing in Canada Infrastructure Program grant funding, and uh, there's a request that we authorize staff to submit the application. Councillor Fox moves it, seconded by Councillor Davis. Discussion on F1. Councillor Davis. Uh, thank you. Um, I just was reading in the report that it will be used for, I guess maybe this is a question through the staff. Um, we used, I actually toured the facility with, with uh, Mayor Froze in 2011, and uh, I didn't know they were going fish in those tanks. But anyhow, um, okay, my question is, we've used aluminum. Could we not use stainless steel, or could is there a reason that we use aluminum? Um, uh, and I just wondered if, because it's, um, you know, it's a lot of money, but I don't know if stainless steel will be, uh, then they, do they last for 17 years, maybe with stainless, or, or should we look that far ahead for our water, and is that, uh, is that Alder Grove plant? Uh, it is the Alder Grove plant, is it, that we're putting the, um, the new tanks in? Mr. Uh, Your Worship, yes, it is for the Alder Grove water treatment plant. And uh, if we are successful with the grant application and, and subject to Council's approval, the plan is to actually replace the existing tank, which is made of aluminum, and to go to stainless steel. That is the plan. Oh, that is the plan. Oh, I didn't... It, it didn't say stainless steel in here, though. It just did it really okay. I just I um, I just knew that there that was a question I had. Thank you. Thank you, no. Councillor Arneson. Oh, thank you, Worship. Well, actually, Mr. Safey um, commented on what I was going to say. I think that if we're successful, this would be a great way to subsidize our critical water infrastructure that's needed. Um, I, I guess in hindsight, and I know that there are budgetary constraints as to why or other informational basis we probably chose what we did in the first place, but it's really important that uh, our infrastructure be maintained, especially has it to do with potable water. So I think this is great, and I hope we're successful. Thank you. So for the discussion, I'll call the question on F1. Well, i got to go back. I gotta, okay, I just have to do a... Sorry, I'm going to call it again. Just have to mark absent. Okay. So go back to 
calling the question. Okay, now I'm calling uh, F1. There we go. And it carries unanimously. Does your not working? No. Okay. But I was in favor. Yeah, so, so. Okay. Let, you know let me know if you're not. Later. All right. F2, um, a simple asset management program, grant funding, another grant uh, application. Can I have a motion, please? Councilor Fox, second by Councilor Arneson. Discussion on F2. Seeing none, I'll call the question on F2. Councilor, it's um, unanimous <laughs> by Council. Thank you. Move on to F3. This is 216th Street from 58th Avenue to 64th Avenue, Water Local Area Service. And uh, can I have a motion, please? Councillor Whitmarsh, second by Councillor Davis. Councillor Fox on F3. Yeah, just quickly, um, please refresh my memory, if I could, through you to Mr. Sefi. It's 62% of the properties were in, within the benefiting area. Is it 60% threshold? Yeah. Mr. Sefi? Uh, so, Your Worship, the preliminary petition process requires, which is a township policy, requires 60% before we proceed to a formal uh, petition process, which is per the Local Government Act, which requires at least 50%. So, my second question is, um, <clears throat> we've uh, now put in all the pipe along 64th Avenue, um, or into that local area service agreement. So this would come straight off of there south, is that the idea? Our piping is all, that infrastructure is all capacity-wise capable? Okay, thank you. Any other discussion? See none, I'll call the question on F3. It carries unanimously. Move on to correspondence. There's um, one item of correspondence, taxi license amendment proposal. Could I have a motion to receive? Councillor Fox, second by Councillor Davis. Councillor Qualley. Thank you. Um, in the staff report, the um, in the staff report it says there are three municip municipalities that participate in this, but the application actually says there's only two. Um, can somebody confirm what the third municipality is? The um, application says Abbotsford and Langley, but I'm assuming it's the city of a Langley would maybe be the third, but it's not specific. Mr. Seffi. Uh, I believe so, Your Worship. Uh, it is the the service area of the company that I think is referenced in the staff memo. Um, yeah, it says um, in the second paragraph of the staff memo, um, it says they are requesting to add four additional vehicles to their fleet, which will service three municipalities. And then in their actual application, it just says, I operate in the municipality of Langley and Abbotsford. So I think it's maybe just an omission on their part to not specify both of them it appears that way councillor okay. yeah. thank you and i just had a second follow-up question and that was around how many uh, so all of these taxis are meant to service all three municipalities do we have any idea or is there any parameters in place for them around how many taxis are actually in service in langley at any time do we have any idea mr seffing your Worship, it's something that we'll have to do some research on. I don't have the information uh, available, unfortunately. Um, okay, so uh, maybe I could just make a referral to staff, if possible, that um, without holding this up. Sorry? Might be a separate motion. We could take right after this. Sure, okay. okay. Then that, that way it keeps this motion. Yeah, so thank you. Yep. Thank you. Well, we'll uh, entertain that motion after this. Councillor Arneson. Uh, thank you, Worship. Um, through your Worship to staff, I'm wondering, um, based on the information provided in the report, it talks about the number of new vehicles that are being sought, but currently the ones that they are able to expand on are, are not anticipated to be accessible. So my question is whether or not we have the jurisdiction to add a condition to their application indicating any percentage of their allowable new taxis to be accessible taxis. Mr. Seffi? Your Worship, my understanding is that Council may provide comments. I don't know if, if those comments can be articulated in the form of, of conditions, but certainly it's a, a provincial matter under the, uh, the appropriate agency, the licensing authority, and they're seeking Council comments, and Council comments could be recommendations, uh, I would imagine, as opposed to conditions. Okay, so um, 
through your worship, I guess to staff, would that also be um, something that could just be in, considered by by council as an additional comment? Would we have to vote on that? That require a motion or just direction? A motion. I'm just asking Mr. Black. Oh, sorry. It, so I'm getting nods and I ask either or. A motion or a direction? Direction is sufficient, Your Worship, okay. but a motion could also be done if uh, the council okay. feels it necessary. Okay, so if uh, Councillor Arneson wishes to make that motion to add that comment, that would be fine, then at least it's in the record. Yes, yeah. Okay. Is there a second? Oh. <laughs> is there a seconder? Just Councilor to Davis? increase, I'm sorry, what's no, the just motion? to Just to uh, add a comment that... Um, a percentage now maybe you can just clarify the motion okay um i attached a number to it but um i guess it's up to the discretion of the individuals that are considering this application to increase the percentage of the allowable new taxis to be mandated to be accessible so that leaves it kind of open-ended but suggesting that we'd like to have more of them to be accessible okay so on the amendment any discussion on that I'll call a question on the amendment. And that's on G1. Carries with Councillor Quali opposed. And on the main motion as amended, Councillor Long. Yeah, well, my original question was what whether we were going to give comments. So now the comment is going to say what we just passed, I guess. But it also says that we have no objection uh, or yeah, I suppose we're going to add the comment about the. Uh, we received it and we sent a comment. Is that Mr. Back? Is that? Yeah, so that's fair. Yeah. So all right, well, and I was going to point out that the address of Alder Grove Taxi Limited is actually in the city. So I guess that's, and this confusion has come up before when uh, when we talked about jurisdictions. So they they are located in the city, and they're asking us to to operate in the township. I gather. That's so it, I wish they would get it straight to say that there are three municipalities. Because everybody takes a taxi to the casino, of course, so that means you have to get to the city somehow. But uh, their address of, of 1975656 is actually the city. Okay, so. fair enough. Anyhow, okay, okay. Well, that's fine. Councillor Qualley? Yeah, thanks. I mean, the reason I opposed Councillor Arneson's motion is because I don't know what we actually need in terms of accessible taxis. I don't know if we're underserved by accessible taxis. Um, I think we're underserved, gravely underserved by taxis in general, so... Uh, that's why I'm going to bring the next motion, but um, that's why I opposed it, because I don't understand where our needs are. Fair enough. So I'll call a question on the motion as amended, G1. Carries unanimously. Hey, Councillor Qualley. Yeah, so motion. I think I'd just like to move a referral to staff. Um, if we could find out um, a little bit of information about how many taxis are actually serving our municipality in general. Uh, from all taxi companies, it says that this company operates 29 taxis in the municipality. Um, sorry, I'm just looking at their uh, at their report. It says, um, what's the maximum number of taxis you can operate in this municipality now? And how many taxis do you want to operate? 33. So, I mean, is this enough? It's not enough because I don't think Langley is being well served by this. So, uh, Motion is to just get a report from staff on the, uh, the amount of taxis levels. from all companies in the Township of Langley and service levels. Is that reasonable request? Sorry. Sure. Yep. Does that make okay. sense? So I need a seconder. Councilor Sparrow seconds discussion on that. Seeing none, I'll call the question. Thanks for translating. Yeah, it's okay. Carries unanimously. Okay, we move on to minutes of committees. Uh, each one is the Recreation, Culture, Parks Advisory Committee. September 12th, Councilor Fox, seconder. Councilor Qualley. Uh, in discussion, call a question on each one. Carries unanimously. And so now we move on to. Uh, okay, sorry. On H, sorry, I didn't realize you were. Yeah, so I mean, I don't know, we passed the minutes. This is H1 we're talking about. H1, right? yeah. yeah so I just yeah, wanted to comment on that? point yeah. out, and, and I don't know if staff can help us to get the word out, but in the report it talked about. Uh, um, I guess um, Ms. Blair reported on how the AECUCC is fully open and functioning and so forth. And it said, the hours of operation are continually being evaluated. Members of the public are asked to email feedback and suggestions regarding the center to PR info, Parks and Rec info, I guess, PR info at tol.ca. So the, I don't know if that's on our township pages anywhere or not, but instead of 
going on Facebook or getting a hold of certain counselors complaining about this and that or offering suggestions or even compliments. Um, it's nice that that's in the, in, the, um, in the minutes, but I think it should be publicized even greater so that the folks, uh, the public have, uh, know that there's a way that they can give feedback no matter what kind. Would that be added to our township page at some point, Mr. Backen, or just some information? Your Worship, I believe the actual communication device or communication line is on the township page. Perhaps we can review its uh, att attempting to highlight it a bit more. Sure. Okay, thank you. And that and that pertains to all parks and rec facilities, I imagine. We're not just picking yeah. on one, but it's That's a right. great it's a great tool, I guess. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Qualley. Uh, you have a notice. Uh, yeah. You have, no, you have a, a notice of motion. Other business. Thanks. Yeah, this was just uh, precipitated by the uh, delegation yeah. we had last week from, um, or maybe two weeks ago now, from Marlene Best regarding our uh, practices. So I'm not going to read the whole motion, but therefore be it resolved. Um, number one, that staff be directed to review current OCP and P zoning bylaw and policies to identify outdated or redundant requirements that could be updated to reduce the cost of house ownership. Two, that this review include input from industry stakeholders, which may or may not, which may include formation of a committee and three seek township to the township seek to lead lower mainland municipalities in this effort so this is a referral to the next elected council okay and um, so you move it second by councillor sparrow uh, discussion on this councillor long yeah it's unfortunate that what we should have done is referred the whole delegation to staff like we normally do we try not to make motions based on what delegations bring forward because there's uh, research that needs to be done before it's considered I know that there's a mention in, uh, in Councillor uh, Qualley's motion about uh, referring to staff, but it is very specific on the three items. And I'm not sure, sure that I can agree with them. I don't know if we want to change uh, houses from having wood on them to everything being uh, uh, vinyl siding, or if we want to change the, uh, uh, the, the, the different, um, I guess, what gardens and, and uh, uh, landscaping and so forth. Anyway, so I, I think it should have been referred last meeting the motion that we have in front of us kind of gives staff direction to actually make the changes. So I would refer the whole motion to staff. Yeah, actually, actually uh, if I read the motion, it just forwarding to the newly elected council for consideration. So these points will go to the newly elected council. Then the council could determine if they would like um, a, a report. Is that? Yep, that's, that's exactly that's the, way the intention. I, I read it. Thank is, you. Is that clear to the staff that that's what it is? So we're not actually directing staff at this point to do it, but the new council could then do a variety of things and get some reports back. So. Uh, I think that helps clarify. Councillor Arneson. Uh, thank you, Worship. I just wanted to uh, commend Councillor Qualley for bringing this forward. I thought it was very informative and a great initiative that we can look at. I, I like the term cost creep that was associated with the delegation. I think further to Councillor Long's point, I, I think, um, as I recall, the last council meeting where this was brought up went till midnight, and so it was probably <laughs> something that um, might have otherwise been addressed at the time. So um, I, I also want to thank um, Ms. Best for bringing this forward because I think that this is something that's come out of her experience as she referenced of 40 years as a developer or a part of the uh, development community. And so I think it would be great for the new council to consider all of um, the information that was provided. Thank you. Councillor Davis. I, um, I think it's a good, uh, although uh, it says number one, that staff be directed to review the current OCEP and just the intent is to go over the redundancy and it's it's not to review the whole OCP it's just the neighborhood plan yeah. and within the redundancy yeah. spot yeah yeah thanks okay so now I'll call the question and see no further discussion carries unanimously is there any other business Terminate. second councillor Fox moves termination councillor Davis seconds it all those in favor Opposed carried, and the meeting is now terminated. Thank you.